Hello and welcome to the Half-Court Press Podcast. I am Jimmy Watkins, the Nebraska basketball beat writer. He is Joel Lorenzi, the Creighton basketball beat writer. It's almost time. Yeah. Like seven weeks away from, from basketball season for real. Practice yeah. officially starts next week. Um, real quick before we start, Joel, I, I just saw that the ACB, the, the I don't know which, I think it's the top league in Spain, um, is experimenting with... The inbound thing? The inbound thing, yeah. So yeah. you don't have, so basically you don't it's have ash. to give the, the ref the ball to inbound it. Why? Do you, so it's asked because why? I kind of, I think it's fun. It's like, bro, what's wrong with the game right now? Like, I think it's fun having to draw ATOs and really scheme and have a team set and oh play. Oh, man, you must really defense. love college basketball. I'm trying to run. I want action. Bro, that's so I want lame. unceasing, if I was unceasing to get game, action. If I was to get game because there's no ref there and. Don't get game. Be ready. That's lame as hell, bro. You're just adding so you're just adding such a I think you're adding crazy dimension. I think you're adding flow, added. which is to me what I think is the biggest problem with basketball right now is too many stops and starts. Like particularly at the end of games, which is not going to change because the last two minutes of games, you still need to give the ref the ball to inbound. And it's it's not that big of a change. Like for teams that want to play super fast, it could be um a, a bigger difference because they're like it's basically an outlet pass after somebody scores, right? But I think how much how much are we? I, I saw a clip of it and it, it looks like feels, everyone's playing you know a lot it faster. Feels like? But it feels street ballish, even like that's what it feels like. But think about like <laughs> think about procedurally what we're taking away. Here's the ball. Now you give it back. Now I pass it in. Is that that different? You also make it a, a big part of college basketball is pressing. Whether you're a fan of pressing or not, it makes it harder to press you doing something like that. And I. I I enjoy some I like, games where they press, you know, like I'm not a fan of damn, a team that presses every you like, game. You like watching kids melt just, with the ball in their hands? Just, That's cruel. This is college basketball we talk about. <laughs> NBA, you, you couldn't do this in the NBA because I think that that's something that in the NBA will serve as like a, a wild card. You couldn't do that every possession. I mean, right. You're talking about pressing, pressing right now? Yeah. No. Oh, you're talking I'm, about the rule. About the, the rule. In the NBA, you couldn't get away with that nearly as often. I don't know. I think I, I just like people that try different stuff. I think it's interesting. Um, maybe that's something. If we can, if, I don't know if there's enough to do that, but maybe that's something we'll do at the top of the show if, if, uh, every week. If there's something new in basketball, uh, we could try that out. All right, today we were gonna have our friend Dirk Chatlin on, but Dirk has illness in the family, so he'll, we'll get him on next week or the week after or something Free like Dirk, that. Man. Free Dirk. Um, instead, we're gonna. Because it's about to be preseason and the the tours, the national media tours have already started. We're just gonna give you a few three to five. I don't know how many we can think of um, dummy storylines to watch out, like a dummy audible. It's, it doesn't mean anything. Words are coming out of people's mouths. Things are being said into microphones. I don't know if anything anything that's being said means anything. I will start. And my first one is just going to be the national media guy tour in general. This was a Nebraska thing last year. Uh, John Rothstein came to the practices and was talking about how Nebraska was going to be unguardable. <laughs> He'd never seen anything. He, seen he had never seen. seen he had never. He was, at, he was at Towson today yeah, did talking, he, talking yeah. about how the it's NCAA tournament or bust at Towson. I don't know where Towson is. I think it's in the DMV. It might even be in uh, D.C. I'm not going to correct you because I have no idea. Anyways, I, I just think that the way that those guys' jobs are set up, like they're information traders, that's how they, they make their money, which means they're very friendly with the staffs, which means that they're like they're not going to go to – a practice and then tweet out a photo of, Hey, here's this recruit that's supposed to be doing really well. That's sitting out during most of the drills or wow, this defense looks pretty rough, which I think is what ended up happening last year with Nebraska Nebraska couldn't guard itself in practice. And it, that translated to the court. The offense stuff did not. So anytime you see, I don't know whether it's Rothstein or, or Jeff Goodman any of those Jeff guys? Jeff Goodman nearly isn't. Just, it, it's just such it's not, a different dynamic. Okay, but he's doing it too. Like he's going around to all these different schools, and he's going to tweet out. This is you know he's going to tweet out a couple of takeaways, and there's just like well, it's a content, certain slant bro. to him. It sure it's content, but just take it. I'm just saying, don't dismiss it. Take it with a grain of salt. Facts. Understand yeah. understand what's happening behind the scenes. Understand that you know the dudes who are like after some of these stops, they're going to like pose for pictures. 
with the coaches, like that means something. <laughs> that means something. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. And side note, we're pretty dumb because Towson is in Towson, Maryland. But um, oh, how, I've never been to Maryland, so I don't. I don't I feel dumb either. at all. Well, but, you said DMV. You're good. Yeah, I did. You got it right. Yeah. But I mean, it feels dumb that it's actually in Towson. That, that Towson is a place? That Towson was, yeah. yeah. Well, you learn something every Whatever. day. And, what you got? And for what it's worth, um, usually I'm like, I despise John Rothstein around this time. Damn, we've been of, throwing this man shade since this podcast look, began. Look, bro, I just, it's a lot of the... Maybe it's the the morning he's just sleep got a at stick. five a.m. because I'm, I'm up at five a.m. We every sleep day. in March. <laughs> I think it's we sleep in May, but oh whatever. I'm not we sleep I'm in not May. That's right. Fan, That's what I, it is. I'll be seeing the tweets, but it, I've I've kind of been it's kind of been compelling recently. Like the the <laughs> the worst fifty days from I college mean, basketball. We're so and so weeks from college basketball. Is, like, I'm any, counting down is, with him. I don't know. You. This is the greatest sign of all that we need basketball in our lives. Joel, <laughs> give me a give me a preseason storyline you don't care about. A preseason storyline I don't care about. Um. Hmm. Well, you mentioned one to me yesterday. That was like um, big men shooting threes, which I'm actually I I I, okay. I usually fall. I mean, you did it once. You did it once. I usually there can fall be, for those. There are I some. For those. It's exciting. It's exciting when you hear that a big man is is going to take more threes. Like actually, last year when Hunter Dickinson, he actually did it. That's great. That's a huge important part of his game to develop going to the next level, especially. But it, it can change the way your offense works. Um, that one and there's a there's a cousin of that one, which is any any player who didn't shoot threes well before is just looking so much better in practice. Like someone, there's some shot doctor <laughs> that's working with them. It's just like <laughs> shooting is like. It's a fundamental skill that tends to be developed super early, and the people who are not great shooters tend to be uber athletic guys who have never really needed to rely on a jump shot. Like you just get past people and jump over people, and big men who that's just not their game. Like they've always been tall, they've always been close to the basket. They, even they could even have a touch around the rim, but shooting a jump shot is a lot different. Um, I would take a guy. <laughs> a Nebraska example that's that's happening right now. Juwan Gary, the dude from Alabama, who's like seven for fifty career on three pointers in three years at Alabama. That they're working with him. That's one of the expressed reasons that he's that he chose Nebraska. You know, he believes in Fred Hoiberg, the shooting coach. Fred, the the master shooter. He made an entire NBA career off of shooting. He's the guy that works with Nebraska players on their jumpers. And he thinks that Fred can get more out of him there. Fred thinks that he can get more out of him there. Fred did, has done a a bang up job on a couple of guys. Like DeAndre Kane was not a shooter before he got to Iowa State, and he left there as a forty percent guy. You know, Trey McGowan's two years ago was like a 36 percent three point shooter at Nebraska on a very low volume, but still. And I'm like Jawan Gary is going to have to shoot. To, for, for, for me to even buy that this guy is like a 30 32 percent three-point shooter i need to see it for like two months i just they can tell me all they want that he looks better they can tell me all they want that Derek walker's shooting threes i'm just i'm not there with it i'm not there with it you know <clears throat> i think a new storyline has been active since the transfer portal became a thing is oh um guys who just transferred saying oh you know i I just feel so much better yes. in this system. This is good. Than the last. It was. <laughs> I am freed from the shackles of my old situation where I didn't play, which was totally not my fault yeah. at all. It was definitely not me. It was the coaches didn't like me or whatever. That's whatever reasons guys give for for yes, new transfer guy. That's a good one. That's a good one. That also, I mean, that applies to Nebraska. That I mean, that's everywhere at this point. Like there, there are transfers all over the place looking for, and you know, the, uh, I, I, another cousin of that one, the mid major guy who dropped like 20 a game. Hey, I'm a believer <laughs> of that. Most times 20 Their numbers are going down. 20 translates to like 10 oh. in high major. That's a starter. That's a Could starter. Be a st- okay. But like, <laughs> is it, t- it depends on what kind of 10 you're giving me. Is it 10 on four, 48, 35, 80 splits? Okay, I'm on board. That's efficient. Is it 10 on 40, 30, 70 splits? Those field goal percentage, three point percentage, That's free nasty, throw percentage. But that means they're probably a first option on a struggling team, first or second option. It so, could just mean that they were 
<laughs> it could just mean that they were better than everyone they were playing before, and now everyone else has caught up to them, and it it requ- it requires them to d- dig deeper into their bag. Well, who's coming into your mind? I mean, let, 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 anyone, any mid mate, like for example, Sam Griesel from Nebraska. He's like thirteen six and four at North Dakota State. It would be. A huge success and, frankly, something of a surprise if he can replicate those numbers on the same efficiency, which he was around 50. Well, what's his stat line this year? He, last year, he was 13, 6, and 4 on 37% shooting from 3. At, I think he was close to 50% overall and 75-ish percent from, from the free throw line. If he if he repeats that, that's such a it's an outlier success. Like, most of the time, you're going to take... You're, it's not just you're taking a step up in competition. You're taking a step up in responsibility. Like that guy's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. Like you're not going, you're not going to Im- maintain your volume while maintaining your efficiency. Most of the time when yeah. you're in that situation, he's, he's in a unique situation. He's got positional size, which a lot of the mid majors do don't like, there's not a lot of six, six primary ball handlers coming from the mid major level. So he is uniquely equipped in that way. He's not going to be overmatched physically, although he might be a little slow footed on defense. Sometimes if he gets matched on point guards, I'm, I'm a little worried about that, but yeah. people like that, not, I, I, not singling out Sam, but like, but like little do like, how about an example like Gonzaga Malachi Smith, who is like this big um, dynamic scoring guard. He's not like getting like 20 something a game at, I think it was Chattanooga last year. He's on the, he was on Nebraska's radar in the portal for a hot second. He's not going to do that in Gonzaga. He's yeah. just not. And if he tries to, it's probably but, not gonna okay, go going to go very well. There's different situations. Like I going to Gonzaga, obviously going to play a role. Right. But does he know that? Like what, that's what I want to know. The, why, they don't have to. Guys get told whatever pre- coaches tell guys whatever they want to hear in the portal to get bro, there. Bro, you're going to Gonzaga, bro. It's certain programs, like dude. I'm just saying. And like, I give a lot of these guys a pass most of the time. Like, I'll watch them, and I'll watch their. I'll take their adjustment. Like, I'll hurt, uh, I'll hold a certain weight to the adjustment from mid major to high major because I know the yeah, production's going to drop. You got drop. grade for great on a curve. Yeah, and so like. Usually, I just try to see how well they play their role, not if they're just starring, how well they play their role. Like, and in some situations are unique, like with Baylor Shireman. Like, he dominated some league, right? Right. And he's not exactly joining a team where he could get the chance to even replicate those numbers. Like, right. he's joining a team where all these guys' numbers are probably going to be even because it's just such an evenly distributed lineup. And while he might be the go-to scorer maybe or, you know, um, second or third ball handler, like the numbers just aren't going to be the same based on the team dynamic. So, like, situations like that, like you got to you gotta grade with the even, the curviest of curves. Like For sure, a know, big like, one. Like most of the class failed the test. I get it. But that's the point, though. Most of the class fails the test. That's why the curve – that's why maybe you are just already – like you, you have already factored in – like the, those that there's not the heightened expectations a lot because well, some people just see this guy scored 20 points per game before but that's I don't cool think, i don't think anybody sees that and says oh yeah i can't wait till he scores 18 points per game at gonzaga no, I, I think they saying damn let me see how well he could play his role here because he killed over there we'll see we'll see um i'm glad you brought up shireman because this what next one is directly related to, to creighton hmm. the team the team that made a nice tournament run the year before, I'm just just caution yourself. Like this, is, you know, yeah, another no, another team that's sure, like this. For sure, Indiana yeah, is I, the that exact was the, same that was the team thing. Came to Indiana we was not going to make the tournament with about I don't know three weeks left in the season last year. Got hot in the Big Ten tournament, looked good in their tournament games, and now they're granted added a really good recruiting class. That's part of this too, but it's mostly the same team. Like the rotation is going to be mostly the same, plus a five star, plus four star. And they're a top 15 team now. Like, the math, it, it's, it's hard for me to, to make that jump sometimes. I, I hear you. And with that take, I don't usually take it with as big of a curve as the last one. Yeah. Like, I'm usually more like, okay, like, I'll buy into some of the preseason hype and be like, okay, they at least deserve to be ranked preseason in this area based on what they did. Because it's a momentum thing. Like, momentum is real. And um, 
I think a lot of times fans will pick and choose with with this take because mm. if you think about it, what you described with Indiana was literally North Carolina, and they it's ended true. up in the national championship. They sucked before the tournament. It's true. Like I was so mad watching them most of the year, and they peaked when it was time. And I don't know did they peak like in the tournament. Like they had their best games of the year, and Caleb Love literally had some of the best games of his career to get them to the national championship. Now they return the same group. They add Pete Nance. Like, they're the same team they were last year. Like, are people going to say that about North Carolina, though? Like, no. Like, they're, like, the number one team in the country. Right. Right. It's it's different, (laughs) I will say. It's different when you make a national championship run and you, like, you know, you beat Duke in the Final Four. And sure, but were they always that caliber of team? I mean, they, they no. could have just peaked at the right time. Could it's they true. have dropped off since? Like, it's true. we don't know that. Totally true. Now, this is particularly, this is you know a direct parallel to, to Creighton, who we, we've talked about this before. Midway through last year, they were a bubble team with a with a young, young, young point guard, Ryan Emhart, about whom we should mention. You have a, a big story dropping this weekend. This weekend, yes, sir. It's coming. Um, and then they sort of take off for, you know, two weeks. They add Baylor Shireman. There's a, the people are already super excited. You know, they took the national champion, uh, national champion to the brink with like five dudes. Then they add one of the most coveted transfers in the country. Francisco Verabello is a nice ad. And all of a sudden, this team that was middling bubble team is a top five preseason team. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a big jump. Yeah, but I think Shireman will do that because, especially with this team, the thing is, like like we talked about with the mid-major to high-major jump, don't expect them to average 16, 8, and 8, right? But, like, even if he fills his role to the point where he averages, I don't know, 12, 4, and 3, that's a great player for them. Like, that's a, that's a great – and not only that, you're elevating AOC's role. Like just off rip, just off play style alone. So I think that's part of why people are so confident. Obviously, Columbus in first round and mock drafts. The freshmen are sophomores now. Kogbrenner. I mean, people got reason to be excited. And frankly, obviously they didn't go as as far as North Carolina, but they didn't have to see Kansas till yeah. the the final round, and they played Kansas just as close. Right. You know I mean, without so Kogbrenner. Without them hard. So I think that's why people are excited. So that, I but that's, but like, that's even a smaller sample size, though. That's an even smaller sample size. I won't be mad like, at Cre- Arthur Creighton fans. The, this is what happens. Arthur, the, last, the last image we have of Arthur Kaluma in our minds is him giving Kansas work. Work. Well, really? On a big the last stage. last image we got of Kaluma well, okay. was him giving grown men work. Sure, and sure, sure. Over the summer. Over the summer, for sure. He was great. But the one, you know, March Madness is a big stage. Kansas is a name brand. Everyone's watching that game. And he's just going, he's going nuts. He's making threes. He wasn't doing that a lot of the year. Trey Alexander, same thing. Was really, was really um, still trying to find his way into a role before Nemhard went down. And then they gave him the ball and he was awesome in that role. Yeah. He was really efficient. He made good decisions. And in that San Diego State game, again, high profile. That was a primetime game. It's 8-9. It went to overtime. It was a crazy game. People are watching it. He was the guy who scored the clutch buckets down the, down the stretch. You don't remember the first 16, 17 games where they were still trying to piece it together and they looked like a young team. You remember that end part. Yeah. And I just think the equations, I've said this before, I wonder if they aren't closer to a top 15 team than they are a top five team, that's either way, they have a chance to make a deep run. But But we forget. We forget a little bit. On the same note, talking about those equations, talking about the plug rules, um, I think the reason, and some of this will be in my story that's dropping, um, from the people I've talked to, I think part of Trey Alexander blossoming as PG1 was some instruction from from Ryan, you know, Uh having him right there on his shoulder because that's all Ryan's ever been. Ryan Ryan had never been asked to score as much as he had last year, before last year. I mean, we're talking about a guy um, obviously played with stars all his life, so he was always the guy trying to make others better. So I think he really helped um, Trey along those lines. And I think 
this upcoming year, um, people also seem to forget that when the game Ryan went down, like he was starting to really figure things out around that time, I think. Um, and now that he'll be back, I don't think he's one to – even though the feeling I get around his team is that there will be times where, you know, a few of them want to be the guy at the end of the game. Like, I think Ryan is probably the least – like the last guy you got to worry about with that kind of thing? I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is that people think lin- or it, it makes sense in our brains for development to be linear, to follow a straight upward slope on a graph. Like you start as a freshman, you're this good. The I next year, yeah. you're this much better. The next year, you're this much better. Yeah. And College for- coaches say that the biggest leap you make typically is from your freshman to your sophomore year but that's not true in every case that's not true in every case and when you have new pieces coming in shireman i think is going to be a pretty seamless fit i just think that particularly with the schedule they're playing early on like they it's not going to it's not going to look as like they're not i don't know what i'm trying to say here it's not going to be the mouth they need frankly so yeah do you think they'll get punched in the mouth early oh hell yeah yeah i mean people and one thing I'll say, I don't think they'll lose at as much as the people who are super low on them think. Like I think they lose two or three games in non conference. One of them probably due to, you know, someone trying to be here. They're gonna lose one in Maui. No, least. yeah, for sure. At least. Um I I think yeah, they'll lose one in Maui and probably lose at Texas. I think those are the three. Um, but people also with Maui, people don't seem to realize like people people keep saying, Oh yeah, they'll lose to Texas Tech and they'll lose to Arkansas. Those are potentially true, but if they lose to Texas Tech, there's no way in hell they play Arkansas because Arkansas is going to beat the brakes off Louisville. So <laughs> you won't have to worry about Arkansas if you can't get uh, past Texas Tech, let me tell you. Fair point. Fair point. Um, okay. I got – is it me or you that's up next? I don't remember. I couldn't tell you. All right. Well, I got another one, and this is new coach swag. <laughs> new coach swag. Anytime, anytime a new coach is hired – it's all it's all good vibes. Uh, Big E's got a lot of a yeah. Lot of Big E's got a lot of those. Big Ten's got uh, <coughs> Kevin Willard at Maryland, and Maryland Maryland's a great example because Maryland has such a fertile recruiting ground. Like the DMV is such a great Fact. basketball area that that program, when it's not going well, people are just perpetually wait like wait till wait till Maryland figures it out. Wait till they start bringing in all the kids in there. Wait their till area. little junior from exactly fifth grade comes exactly in. exactly like all these kids with. <laughs> In that area, that rep in D.C. 2029, yeah. five-star. Exactly. That This is the kind of, like, it doesn't even, like, Kevin Willard did a pretty good job at Seton Hall. It doesn't matter. Every time there's a new coach in town, it's, it's a new culture, and there's just hope. Because before, it's hope in hope by default because before there was so, there was so little. The Maryland stuff got pretty, it just gives a drab drab situation last year that was just like the the coach they lost their coach early and it's hard to do the interim coach thing and now they're <coughs> and now they've they're freed from those um from those constraints and it's it feels really good so uh, there's a lot of programs right now that are looking up and, and thinking the sky is the limit and it's the limit's probably a little lower than you Man, think I'm, I'm sorry i didn't mean to laugh while you talk i'm laughing because i'm thinking about we named some of these preseason. Uh, takes and frankly, I, I buy into like half of these. I'm not gonna lie. Well, like, okay. Well, you can push back. Well, look, you can push back. I'll say, at least in the Big East, um, like Shaheen, I really like Shaheen. Mm-hmm. All right, like, but like, is guy. it gonna happen now? Oh, no. I mean, they're like a middle of the pack or like bottom of the top half. So, like, that team, that team, so that team could be on Nebraska's schedule. Seton Hall plays Memphis in the Orlando, in the SPN Invitational. And if I don't the, think Seton Hall will whoop Nebraska, but I think Seton Hall will beat them. Okay. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, there's a lot of there are very few teams you gonna put Nebraska I agree. up against. And I'm, I'm just like, saying, yeah, I'm Nebraska just saying, got to do it right I'm there. I'm just saying, <laughs> you're right. But like new coach, bunch of new guys doing a bunch of new things. Fred's got a bunch of new guys too, but like it's you know, the well, they co- do all the, the things Shaheen coach. likes, frankly, from okay. what I'm saying. Okay. And Shaheen, man, that's a, that's a great a. You can say what you want. 
bro, and I liked I liked his team at St. Peter's. Like I started to I really started to grow to like those guys. But I think most of that was because of Shaheen and the stuff he drew up for well, them. Well, now we're mixing takes, right? It's like it's half the team that made a great tournament run and the new coach swag. <laughs> the new coach has the tournament run. But the coach was such a big part of that he tournament was. run and yeah. the things he drew up and the, the timely plays he drew up at that and how he just used those guys. I mean, dude, they took down Kentucky. Like, that's no light feat. Like, for sure. And it's Not catching anybody he, by surprise anymore, though. No one's overlooking you. Facts. No but one's know, overlooking you. I mean, he's still a he's still a great mind in terms of the X's and O's. I think. I mean, he made some really timely. And if it wasn't even the, I, I never even saw. At least I wasn't playing so close attention, but I never saw the craziest sets. It's just a a down screen here, a flare here, like just the right players at the right time to bury Kentucky and bury the teams that they played, and just getting the most out of the guys on his team. And now he got legitimate Big East athletes. On his squad, so I the other know, the man. other thing about Shaheen, which makes it which makes the hype even even crazier, is that he played there. The, and Nebraska just went through this with the with Scott Frost, who got fired. We don't usually talk about football on the show, but it's a it's a parallel. <laughs> it's a it's a parallel when the when the dude that you loved as a player comes back as the coach, and he's like the hot coach. That is that is a different level. Yeah. that's a different level of new coach swag. Well, lucky for us, and I always find myself. I don't know where I stand on the spectrum. I'm usually anti great player as a coach because yeah. they usually suck. Like True. Um, it's, to it's a thing. They don't have like they don't have like the they they my theory on it is they don't have the patience to wait for other guys to see what they see so fast. That's what I think it is. Sure, and I think a lot of them fail to understand even when they hire great staffs, like, dude, the game has changed them. around you. Mm-hmm. Um like I'm trying to think, like, bro. Uh, Pat Ewan sucks. Um, <laughs> Isaiah Thomas was horrible. He was bad. Chris Mullen's career Didn't, flailed out. It was out. quick. Like, I'm trying to think of all the greats to try to coach, and I can't think of a Larry really Bird made Nature Conference Finals. Yeah, coaching fair. Reggie, yeah. but didn't last long. There's, there, there's certainly outliers, yep. but like it's it's generally not a good thing. Like you, generally it tends to be you like got to get the guy who was a role player right. because they they just get it the most. Yeah, I don't know what it is. They get it the most. It's true. It's true. You got any other ones? Well, on the on the coaching hype front, I think uh, Xavier fans should be happy about Sean Miller too. And I, that's different. You, you, that's different. You know, uh, you've seen I'm, it already. Yeah, and I, I it brings up another debate. It's probably not related to this podcast at all. But um, there's there's some people that are just so pure hearted. OMG, we got to preserve the the pureness of basketball. That they will literally look at a coach who had a scandal before and be like, oh, we got. We we can't take them on because it's nil season. If you have a scandal, I think the price goes up. You already know how to get. You already know how to hand bags to people. That's the game now. Okay, that's the game now. <laughs> you are ahead of the curve. Facts. A pioneer, Sean. You could, Sean Miller, former former disgrace coach, now nil pioneer. That's who he is. Word. And and you know I bring this up because me and my homie used to talk about this when I was at Mizzou. Hey, we we would talk about because um, this is when hmm, I'm trying to think. Auburn has been really good the past few years, and Bruce Pearl is obviously their coach. And so my boy would be like, "Oh man, Bruce Pearl, yeah, I just don't." We'd be talking about like great coaches. I'd be yeah. like, "Man, Bruce Pearl, he's a dog," and he'd be like, "Bruce Pearl, yeah, I I, I can't get with him. Uh, he's he's too skeevy." I'm like, "Skeevy, bro, who name cares? of the game, I'm like, bro, who cares? Not who cares? I care a lot. I want skeevy." Word. I want slick like back I'm, hair. I want I want like slick back a, hair. I want like if you know if you know somebody you're not supposed to know. I want uh, that's a reference now. I want I want the bag man top of your reference line. I want to call. I want to call him. I want to see where you are in his in his list of bag man priorities. Like how like how many how many question of questionable <laughs> sources of revenue are you linked to? Let's like that's, how how high can we get? And if, that's like, where we're at now. Like bro, that's and I just. I tend to be like, yo, like these guys are some of the better coaches. Like, if Iona's in a tournament, I'm picking them. Like, just- it's a chicken. Okay, well, that part is it's a chicken. It's a chicken or the egg thing to a certain extent because you need dudes. Name of the game is having having players. They were it just, doesn't matter they how good of coach in the you wrong are. Era man, that's all yeah, it is. Like, they exactly. Started coaching at the wrong exactly. Time. That's yeah. I mean the the <laughs> the name of the game is getting players. 
and if you if you have however you get it done, it doesn't matter anymore. There's no there's basically no rules. So that's the that's the name of the game. All right, uh, we're gonna do rap takes real quick. This is a quick one this week. Um, there was where did I send this to you in text? Right, I sent yeah. this to you in text. Um, there was a story I think last week. Last what, week, what what side did that story come on? I'm trying. Jeez, I have to go through so many hoops to use our in our in office Wi Fi. I have to. It's ridiculous. Hold on. That's not. That's not my email. This is great. This is great audio content. Whatever. There's a story. I'm just gonna Google it. Basically, the story is about. I think it's called something like. The painful mediocrity of white rappers. Oh, you really can't find this right Dude, now. No, you don't. Okay, you know what? I'll go into it. I'll go into it. I wasn't gonna. I found the story now. I literally have it, bro. I found the story now. It's on tabletmag.com. It's by Jason Buford, and it's about Jason Buford. My people from Chicago. You know, okay. the, the last name. You're gonna see the last name makes a lot of sense here with what he's talking about. What I, the reason why it took me so long to get there is because I have to put in basically no matter what, even though I've been here in here a thousand times. And I've put my password in and username in a thousand times. I still have to enter my information basically every time I want to go on the internet. It's very frustrating. But neither here nor there. It's called The Painful Mediocrity of White Rappers. It is about Jack Harlow and Mac Miller and how their ascent to superstardom in rap music is easier because they are white. Like many other things that are easier in, in America, because you're white. Joel, I'm the, I'm the resident white man here, so I'm just going to throw my hands up. <laughs> I'm going to pass the baton to you. I asked Look, you to read this. What was your takeaway? He do had some unique framing of this. I think... Um, I agree. Yeah, Jack Harlow. And, and this is one thing I hate that black people will do on Twitter is, you know, a white person could hit a dance, and they'll be like, oh, he invited to the barbecue. Like, bro... <laughs> And so Jack Harlow is literally like the embodiment of that to me. And um, I will say like Jack Harlow did a thing where I don't know how many white rappers could do this, but Jack Harlow actually got a few like hits. Like he right. actually got some catchy songs to him. So like right. that really helped him a lot. But a lot of it has been Jack Harlow's good with people. He got like this charming effect that like, you feel me? Like people just like about him. He gets with the right people. He's he's with Girl, he, girls seem to like him a lot. Right, like he's yeah. with he's with Drewski. He's with the people that right. are like he's with Drake. Like he mm-hmm. he gets with the right people, and it's like part of it is it's become a lot of his personality fused more with the music, and uh, it's helped him a ton. I mean, it helps to have hits as as high charted as he's had, but um, but yeah, no, I agree. Like, and be, maybe because people buying his personality more than his music maybe i don't know maybe that's my view dude is probably right the 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 mediocrity of a white rap does allow guys like that to ascend but the framing the framing of mac miller in his career i never heard that before like, so I, okay so here's the thing i'm i'm a hu- i'm wearing mac miller hat right now as i didn't do yeah. that on purpose but what I'm what I'm not about to do is go. Mac Miller was more than a rap. You don't understand. Like I'm not going to be the white dude who stands up here and capes for the other white dude. That's like it's like uh, like you you watch a basketball game. They got a former coach in the booth, and he won't criticize anything that the other coach is doing because coaching is a fraternity and they never say anything negative. Like if you watch if you watch Jeff Van Gundy call a basketball game on ESPN and Tom Thibodeau is the coach on the screen, those dudes are boys, and everything is going to be about they're not executing. You know, the, the players are doing something wrong. The co- I'm not going to do that. It's, it's, it's a waste of my breath, and I don't think it's productive. What I will say is, I think this is, I think it's like a, a reverse engineering of like the, the point that representation matters. White people see white people that look like them in rap music. There's not a ton of them. Like, ooh, I gravitate towards that. Sure. One of the biggest bands in the world is uh, what's the K-pop? Is it BTS? You asked in the wrong K-pop. Dude, I don't. Bro. I don't know either. B- I think there's. A, I think it's called BTS. They're like seriously that lead right, lead the key. universe in music streams. Whatever. It's a, it's an Asian K-pop band, and most of their fans I don't know, but I am guessing are Asian. So I think that that's what happens here. You see, white white people are the people who are 
like taste makers. They they are the people who sign people to record labels in many cases, and the, and the, them as cooks. See, stop laughing at me. Z, stop <laughs> laughing at me. I'm making an eloquent point here. <sighs> they see someone that they can sell because they see themselves in those people. I agree 100%. Like early early career Mac Miller, like the frat rap, you know whatever kool-aid frozen pizza blue, blue slide park stuff the rapping was not high level like he was in the same xxl class remember when that used to, to mean oh, something yeah. as kendrick lamar <laughs> there is no yeah. comparison but you between know, those two that was the mac i like rappers that was that was a that was a different lane bro like i a, i could respect at the time it. but sort of sort of not though because like asher roth the same thing he, like he was compared to asher roth a lot early sure. in his career like there were a lot of white dudes running around rapping about smoke and weed and like I got, you know, a mixtape in my backpack, that sort of yeah. stuff, which is what he was doing early on. But, like, bro, like, Nike's on my feet is, like, goes Absolutely goes. Ever. But that's to your point about Jack Harlow. Like, Jack Harlow got big because what's, pop, what's popping was a crazy beat and he could flow over it. Okay. See, but Jack Harlow is, like, Jack Harlow is the prime example of this. Like, 100%. that's the guy you I, Actually, use. I would say Macklemore. Because oh, Macklemore, yeah, Macklemore is a better example. Like, if I was going to sub out Macklemore, I'd go Macklemore because Macklemore... Sucks, Macklemore <laughs> Macklemore, Mac- hey, bro, this is why I be saying they need to get me on the Aux in, in Soko because every time I go there, they playing Macklemore like they're, three times they're playing the, a match, bro. This is the like moment. They, they average on. a Macklemore song per set, bro. It, it really pisses me off. Aren't they? But aren't they playing the This is the moment? They playing that one? Man, I don't, you trying to get me to That's recite, the only one bro, I know. Discography? I'll, Hell no. no. I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> I'm man. I'm not trying to. But look, I was, Harlow is the prime example because you're right. Exactly what you said. Like, Bro is literally replicating lanes that have already been done, but like there are there are outliers to me. Like Eminem, obviously, they a whole different lane to me. Yeah, uh, but but like the fact that he was white is a huge part. Like if he like he wouldn't be like the highest selling artist of all time. Like he's he's a good rapper. He's not that good of a rapper, right? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Macklemore. He, he like top seven for me, top six. He's right up there. Yeah. He's right up there. But for the Macklemore thing is just crazy because the reason I bring him up is that because was like a fever he dream. won a he won a Grammy the same year that Good Kid, Mad City <sighs> came out for rap album of the year. Remind me, bro. That's the craziest thing. There, like, was, there were other albums. There were other. Good I don't remember what the other one. I just know that I like think Good Kid, Mad City. There. Good Kid. I think that probably was a, that would have been Jesus. Good Kid, Mad City is like universally accepted as the best album by the artist who is universally accepted as the best rapper of our generation, and it didn't win a Grammy. Because well, I'd like some... to leave it up for more. <laughs> I'd like to leave it up. We're for not going to argue debate, about it, but it, it, it's my favorite is, album by okay. him. Yeah. Is that is that not universal? Like I feel like most people think Good Kid, Mad City is the best country oh, album. No, there are some real uh, Tim Butterfly diehards out there. Okay. Go read read a Bible and, somewhere and, else. And damn, <laughs> the people like damn a lot. It feels yeah. like his most complete Kimetsu, albums. Right, I people. like listening to music. I don't to pimp a butterfly. You need to be like in your room with your headphones on and blanket over your head. Like Kimetsu, <laughs> Kimetsu, City, you can just play in your car and be like, oh shit, this goes. I feel you. Yeah, yeah. I, I I was a real. I had a to pimp a butterfly phase. I'll say like I really. I like that I like album every album. album that guy makes, but come on. Let's well, do, I don't know. This year, I don't know. All right, man. so we just had. Just had a discussion about race on the podcast. Yeah, How we feel about it? We How we think boundaries. it went? Are you not gonna catch me doing that too much? I'm not the political type. Okay, I'm not. We're not gonna talk about football. We're not gonna talk about. I'm more worried. Honestly, I'm more worried about me than you. I'm my profile is the one that tends to get in trouble in these <laughs> moments. <laughs> well, I think we did. You think okay. I did okay? Yeah. All right. That's all for today. And Gia got the best album of the year. He does have that. I, I said that two weeks ago. Besides Brent. <laughs> besides Brent. We talking about rappers okay. here, but. All right, that'll do it. I'm Jimmy Watkins. He's Joel Lorenzi. Thank you for listening to Half Court Press.